Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14, as we're going through this book. <clears throat> Have you ever become discouraged as a Christian, um, possibly after listening to the news, and you get discouraged about what looks like the world's steady march toward utter rebellion against God? And so maybe you've concluded at that point that there's nothing that you can do to stop this, that it seems like there's this inevitable decline into godlessness. And uh, truthfully, I think many Christians are in that, specifically in our country today. I think that a lot of Christians get in that mode. I, I just was talking to a guy um, on the, in the airport. We got delayed oh, a couple hours um, due to the weather up here. That's what they said. I, hopefully it was true. And it intra God orchestrated that because the guy was uh, supposed to fly out the day before. And they kept him there until like 3 in the morning trying to fly out. To, he was trying to fly, I think, into LaGuardia. He's from Brooklyn. And uh, I was flying into Newark. So he ends up going on the Newark flight. And this is like quarter to 6 we're leaving. And then we got delayed. Um, we got delayed until it was like 7.30 or, or after. And um, so anyway, but we, we got um, talking, and one of the last things he said to me just before we got on the plane, he said, do you think there's any hope for America? It's an interesting question. Or he said, are, are, are we going to be okay? Something like that. And I said, I don't know. I, I, I certainly believe there's hope, but do I, do I know we're going to be okay? I said, I don't know. He said, well, that's an honest answer. Truthfully, God has convinced me a number of years back through my belief in an imminent rapture, actually, that there is hope of a major work of God among his people and a tremendous ingathering of souls across the world in my lifetime. But put yourself in the camp of believers or even those who are not yet willing to accept Christ as Savior because of the tremendous cost, put yourself in the in the shoes of the people that are being dealt with in Revelation 14. And there is nothing they're going to do to stop the rise of the Antichrist. There is nothing that they're going to do to stop the deception from going out across the world. Can you imagine the, the potential of hopelessness for those people? I can't, I can't even fathom it. And we, at, in chapter 13... We looked at last week how Satan is going to have his unholy trinity. He's going to basically make it impossible for you to be part of society without bowing the knee to this uh, false religion, without um, accepting whatever the mark of the beast is going to be. And with uh, such power and deception as described in the ch previous chapter, rolling like a massive tidal wave across the world, I think many would be tempted to say, why even fight for the truth? Why not just kind of just uh, uh, forget this battle and, and either give in and submit, which is what Satan wants them to do, or just to, just to try to, you know, like a turtle crawl into your shell until this whole thing uh, is over. And yet, as, if, if that's how they would be feeling, a Revelation 14 is for those people but I will tell you all the more so, we as Christians ought to be thankful for the messages that come out of these five little short, um, uh, these, these short little visions that John has right here in chapter 14. And so before we get started, let's ask God's blessing upon his word. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the privilege of being able to study your word together. Lord, open our hearts and minds that we might understand your word and how it applies um, Lord, there is obviously much more here than, than I will be able to handle and, and, and explain. And the reality is, Lord, we're still looking into a fog whenever we're looking into the future. And yet we're grateful for what we can see. And Father, your hand, just like it is upon us today, your hand will be upon your children in that day. And we're grateful that your power and your majesty will be on display as they are today. 
And uh, Father, we ask that you'd open our minds and hearts to what your word has to say, give us understanding of it, and apply it to each of us as only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. The first little vision that John has in the, is in the first five verses. And this is a vision that shows that God can protect against all odds. Now, we've just seen, at the, and let me just back you up to chapter 13, just so you see what I'm talking about. Um, uh, in verse 15, this, this false religious leader will have the power to give life under the image of the beast. I'm in chapter 13, verse 15. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So now, if you're not following with this false religion, you, you'll pay for it with your life. Verse 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So I want you to think about being a complete outcast of society. You can't have a job where you can buy or sell. So you can't, uh, you have no way of, of really supporting your family. This is, this is a horrific time. And, and if you're thinking about being a believer during this horrible time, notice chapter 14, verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. Okay, so who is the lamb? Christ. It's clearly Christ. Mount Zion. Jerusalem. So what we see right, right off the, the, the bat is the, there's some unique blessings. We'll see the 144,000 next here. He says, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now some of you may actually have, in your translation, and I think there's some, there's some a cause to believe it's there, it's not just the father's name but the son's name as well in, your, in their foreheads. So what we see is this unique meeting with Christ. Now, the 144,000, as they'll be described here, we already saw in chapter 7 that they are Jewish young men who are going to take the gospel to the world. We'll see more of their description here when we get down to verse 6. But we see this unique meeting with them and Christ. During all of this chaos, during all of this viciousness, now is this picturing them at the end of the tribulation? Possibly. Is it possibly going on in, our, in, in the middle of it? It's possible. Uh, Christ is not limited by what he can do with these people. But you'll notice it's a very peaceful scene. Keep reading. It says, it says uh, he stood on Mount Zion, with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now, remember, there's a vicious persecution going on. We saw in chapter 7 that there would be 144,000 called to be witnesses. What I find interesting, that they're all still alive. They're all still there. It's not 139,000. It's, it's 144,000. The same group is still preserved. They're still alive. And they have this unique seal from God. The seal of the Father in their foreheads. And again, some of you may have that Christ's seal is upon them as well. It's a seal of protection, by the way. Verse 2. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of great thunder... And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no one could, could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from on earth. So these people have a unique meeting with Christ. They have a unique seal of God. They also have a unique song from God. Now, um, there's a lot of details we could talk about in that section, but I think it probably would not do you a lot of good uh, to, to speculate through there. So let's just uh, move on about this unique song. And we'll talk about the next unique thing that these people are enjoying, and that is unique characteristics for God. Notice, if you would, verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Okay, so these are young men that... Uh, uh, still have their virginity. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. So, uh, by the way, let me back up because it says they, they were, uh, these are they which were not re defiled with women. They are virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. 
and in their mouth was found no guile. The word guile means what? Deceit. For they are without fault before the throne of God. So let's talk about what makes these 144,000 so unique. You notice, first of all, they are redeemed. That was down there in the, toward the bottom of verse 4. Now, what does it mean when you are redeemed? What does, that, what does that biblical term mean to us? I'm sorry? Cleared? They are, they are cleared. Keep going, Amy. Bought back? That's what the term literally means to be bought back. It means they're, they're born again. They're saved. These are human beings, okay? They're not angels. They're human beings. They've been redeemed. They've been bought by the blood of Christ, okay? They're also not defiled with women, which means they've not been immoral even before their conversion. But they are converted. They're converted young fellows who uh, have not um, been uh, uh, defiled with women. Now, it also mentions they're the first fruits to God and to his Son. Now, when you talk about what's the first fruit, what does that mean? I'm sorry? Uh, you're saying firstborn in the family? Uh, you could look at it that way, but I don't think that's what he's talking about here. But yes, you could look at it that way. First fruits. Man, I'm hearing somebody. I can't just pick you out where you're... The best. First fruits are all often the best. Very good. There's something else about being the first fruits. You're the first. There's a lot more coming. Okay, now if you're the first fruits, which means you're the first, they're the first of what? They're redeemed. The Apostle Paul would talk about some people being the first fruits of a region. First fruits of Achaia. What is he talking about? You're the first people converted in that area. Okay? And so I would submit to you that these 144,000 are the first ones who get converted during the tribulation period. Probably by the two witnesses. So these are the first fruits of God. They've come to know Christ. They now are really the, they're the, the missionaries that go across with special protection from God to reach the world. Now, notice what else he says about them. They have no deceit in their mouths. Boy, is that going to be necessary in that, cult, in that world? It's hard enough for us. Are there certain things that you don't dare say? Honestly, it's not right. I'm just saying, are there certain things that you don't dare say that, that you are thinking, and there's nothing wrong with what you're thinking. It's just sometimes we're intimidated out of telling the truth. These guys are going to tell the truth in a world of lies. We ought to be the same way, by the way. doesn't mean you have to tell everything you know. Someone said, don't tell everything you know because somebody may ask a question afterwards. But uh, the truth is, is that these guys are not going to lie. They're not going to go in with the, with the culture or whatever they're saying in that day. One more thing. He says they're without fault before the throne of God. Now, these are human beings. The idea is if they're living a sincere and godly life, they're all about the Lord and his work. God is using them mightily. So we see this peaceful scene of the fact that God can and is protecting his children according to his will, even in the most horrific days on earth. We see another scene here, and that is that God is making special calls to the lost in unusual ways. And can I say that, that some, not, not in this kind of degree, but some of that is even going on now. I, and I know that sometimes you read things, and like I'm sure you're like me on this, many of you would be, hopefully, and that is you don't believe everything you read. You know what I'm saying? Hopefully. I don't care where, where, what direction it comes from, left, right, center. You just can't believe everything you read. And there have been many who have talked about, um, in, specifically in countries where the gospel is not allowed to penetrate very easily because there's much government hostility. I don't know if some of you have heard about individuals that seem to be coming to Christ and they've had some kind of a vision or something going on. Maybe some of you have heard about that. And I honestly, whenever I hear that kind of experiential thing, a red flag goes up in my mind. You know what I mean? It's like, well, you know, maybe, maybe not. I don't try to buy in. 
But I will tell you that, that uh, a guy that's been in this church and is a man of integrity, Tim Kazee, many of you know him, knows personally of a guy that um, actually was uh, being witnessed to by a Christian. He was over in, in, in um, uh, was a Muslim over in Africa and, and actually struck the Christian for witnessing to him. And that evening, he had a dream that basically said, you need to go to the church. <laughs> he goes there, is converted, and doesn't just, you know, have this nice happy little experience. He actually becomes a pastor and took the gospel to one of the most satanic areas of his country, a place that they said, do not go there. Many of you have seen that maybe in one of the frontline films. And uh, you can go there. Tim is showing you the church that he started. So I think there's genuine fruit of something that, you know, again, I'm not saying that every one of these cases is legit, but I think um, you can see evidence of, in that case at least, that God was doing this. And so I want you to notice what's going on. There's three different angels that show up in verses 6 through uh, 13, and there's much to learn here. So let's, let's read them. Verse 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. And every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Now I want you to think about what he just said. <clears throat> There's going to be an angelic messenger during this horrific time that's going to take the gospel to every nation and kindred, that's family group, and every tongue or language of people. So God is going to get the word out to people during the tribulation period. And what is this angel preaching? He's preaching what's called the everlasting gospel. So what does that involve? Well, let's see what he says. Saying with a loud voice, verse 7, Fear God. There's the first part of it right there. Fear God. Now what's the Antichrist saying? Oh, God's he's slandering God. He's blaspheming God. Making up all kinds of lies against God and his people. Slandering who the Lord is and what he's like. By the way, is that any of that going on today? Oh, yeah. All the worst then. Fear God. What does he say next? Give glory to God. Notice again in verse 7. And give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. You're saying, we're going to give glory. And the angel is saying, give glory to God because God's going to judge this world. Yeah. Yeah. That God's going to step in. He's going to judge this world. We are, ought to glorify him for doing it. And there's one other thing he's saying to them. Worship him. And who is this God that we're to worship? Worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. That's the God who created us, isn't it? And so this angel is going across the world to the peoples of the world and getting out the message, <clears throat> as well as the 144,000 who will not lie. And in the midst of this horrific time of deception and, and what looks like Satan just completely winning the day, is actually God is not only preserving people according to his perfect plan, and we'll see in a moment that he's not preserving everybody from dying. Many, many, the vast majority of them are going to die, the, of people, not the 144,000, he's preserving them. But many who come to know Christ as a result of their ministry are going to die. They're going to lay down their lives. And so he's also getting the message out through this first angel. <clears throat> There's a second angel, come up in verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink, of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And so a second angel announces the fall of Babylon. Now, uh, what is this um, fall of Babylon? Well, I'll give you a couple thoughts on it. Um, why did, by the way, back up. Why does he mention Babylon is fallen, is fallen? Why does he repeat himself? Is the angel stuttering for some reason? I think we know that's not happening. Why would you repeat yourself like that? Okay, what's that? Emphasis. Okay, what are you thinking? Somebody was saying something over here. Same idea? Okay. I'll give you a couple thoughts on that. I think the, it, the idea of emphasis is, is definitely true. Might also be indicating the certainty and imminence of this fall. 
Joseph was interpreting the dream for Pharaoh back in Genesis chapter 41, verse 32. And you remember, Pharaoh had two dreams. They were slightly different, but they were the same. He said the dream is one, and he says God has given you those two dreams because, and I'm quoting now, it's established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. <clears throat> if you remember, <clears throat> excuse me, in Daniel chapter 5, when, uh, when Belshazzar was mocking the, uh, 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 the God of Israel the, uh, on the very night where the Medo-Persian uh, army is outside the city gates of Babylon, they call in uh, for this uh, booze party, they call in the vessels of the temple in Jerusalem, and they drink their booze out of the, the, the sacred vessels of the temple, and they're praising their gods of wood and of stone, and if you remember, a hand came on the wall, began to write. Meany, meany, same word twice. Tikal you farsin. Now, the idea of the first two, why, why repeat the first one? It, may, it really means weighed, weighed. You're weighed in the balances, you're found wanting. And the emphasis was, again, upon this fact that this is happening and it's happening now. Belshazzar uh, was killed that night, the city of Babylon fell to the Medio Persians on that night. Um, now, th who is this Babylon that he's mentioning? It certainly is a city, because you'll notice he says that great city. Is it a literal city of Babylon that will be rebuilt? Possibly. It could be another city that is um, uh, referred to it like that. I'll give you an example of that. Back in chapter 11, look if you would at verse 8. Sometimes God will use a a, 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 like a title of a, of a former city or a former area That'll kind of give you an idea as to what the character is like. Chapter 11, notice if you would, verse 8, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord was crucified. Now, where's that? We know where Jesus was crucified. Jerusalem. He said spiritually it's like Sodom and Egypt. Well, it could be that that is going on here, that this is a name representing some great city that will be like Babylon. Or it could be that that city will be rebuilt. We're not sure. Notice also the reason why Babylon will be judged. It's right there toward the end of verse 8. Because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now you see the word wrath there? Uh, so I was reading uh, both sides of that. It can, and some of you may have this reflected, it can mean the passion of her fornication. Or it can mean that God's wrath is falling upon her because of her fornication. And that can refer to everything from immorality to the basic rebellion against God and his principles. But the idea is Babylon is going to be judged. Some great city that is the fountainhead of the passion for immorality that is going across the entire world. And God's going to end it. Now there's a third angel. And I want you to notice verses 9 to 11. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of, cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. So this third angel that is going to speak is warning not to take the Antichrist's mark. And so the first angel is telling people, how can you be saved? He's answering that question in every language across the world. The second angel... What's he doing? He should, he's saying, why should you be saved? And here's why. Because this whole false system, and, and, and again, there's a fountainhead of it uh, represented by the city of Babylon. This whole system's coming down. So you need to turn to the Lord because it's, it's, this is all going down. And then the third angel, what's he doing? He's saying you need to make a decision. You can't hang in the middle. Because in that day, you're either going to live or die based upon what you do. You can live for now, for a few short months or years, 
if you bow the knee to the Antichrist, but you will suffer eternally. Can you imagine being put in this spot? And we're sitting here in a fairly comfortable room. Most of us, if you gave your heart to Christ, you may have a few people that give you a dirty look. and That'd be about it. Imagine being in a spot where what you're doing is if you say, I will accept Christ as my Savior, I will identify with the Messiah, you are basically signing your own death warrant. That's their decision. Now, verse 12 and 13, we get some lessons from the angels themselves. By the way, those are the reasons why you don't want to take that mark. Verse, verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So the, um, the uh, lessons from the angels, first of all, is that, let me back up there, there we go. God's true children can and will endure against the Antichrist. Notice how he says it. Here is the patience or the endurance of the saints. The saints of God are still going to endure this. But I don't think we can imagine what it would be like. If you remember in chapter 7, when, well, let me take you back there. Just, I don't, uh, we got time. Let's just go back there real quick. Chapter 7. And I want you to notice, because this is the same uh, time period that we're dealing with here. And there's this huge crowd of people. Um, it's right after the 144,000 are identified. Okay, so we, we know them as the, basically, the, the Jewish missionaries who will carry the gospel to the world. Chapter 7, start at verse 9. After this I beheld... And lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and under, under the Lamb. And the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts that fell down before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And again, you see the, the, the contrast, by the way, as you go through Revelation, between the heavenly scenes of worship and praise to God and the disasters that's going on down on earth. Verse 13. And one of the elders um, answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed, arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? So, one of the elders comes up to John, he's having this vision, he says, Okay, now, who are all these people in the white robes? Where did they come from? John makes a pretty good answer. I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. John doesn't know. He says, I, I bet you do. And he said unto me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Those are the people that we're getting another look at here that those angels are reaching out to, that the 144,000 are reaching out to, that are giving, they're, 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 they're deciding for Christ under great persecution during that tribulation period. Keep reading verse 15. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. So if these people are now in heaven with the Lord in his presence, so what happened to them? They were killed. Okay. Notice what he says about them. Verse 16. They shall hunger no more. Why would they be hungry when they were on earth? They couldn't buy or sell. Neither shall the sun, uh, uh, they shall not thirst anymore. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. These are people who had gone through horrific suffering. Now we're getting another look at what this is like. And so in chapter 14, this third angel is uh, the lessons that come, excuse me, from these three angels is first of all that God's true children, they can and they will endure against the Antichrist. There's a second lesson. Back in uh, chapter 14 again, verse 12, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith 
of Jesus, what we're learning is endurance identifies God's true children to the world. It's not just those who, you know, kind of go along for a while. These are people who will actually persevere till the end. And if you can think about it, well, just, and please understand, I am not equating this, okay? Please understand. But when the, when the, the vaccine mandate came in, were there people that, that lost their jobs and willingly walked away from their jobs? There were. And there were other people that decided, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to join. Uh, imagine if something like that meant your death. You'd have people who would, would, would hold out until the last moment and then say, okay, I'll do it. Well, that, that, this is the, kind of, the only thing is we're not talking about vaccines. We're talking about accepting Christ as Savior. We're talking about heaven and hell here. That's what we're talking about. And so there are people that are going to be on the fence saying, well, I, I, I think this is true, but I don't know if I want to pay the price for it. And so what God is saying, the people that actually endure to the end, you can tell that they are truly saved. That's exactly, by the way, what Jesus said in Matthew 24. He that endures to the end shall be saved. Talking about the very same period. We also learn this lesson, that dying in the Lord at this time is a blessing. Look at verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. There are two reasons why God said, actually, it's going to be a blessing when many of these people die a martyr's death. And the first one is your troubles will be over. You see the word labors there? That actually, literally, if you took the word, its literal meaning is beating. That's the literal meaning of that word labors. Now again, there's more to it than that. But the idea is simply this. These people are going to be beaten up with all kinds of trouble. And when they, are, when they uh, 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 go on to be with the Lord, even dying a martyr's death, there's a blessing. And he said something else. Their works are going to follow them. Now, I'm not sure all that means. I certainly know it means that, that they're, uh, what they've done for the Lord is going to be rewarded. But I also wonder if it doesn't also bear into the fact that their testimony that they've borne before other people, that other people will follow in their footsteps and will come to know Christ because of their faithfulness. That leads us then to the third. Uh, actually, there's only four little visions. The third one is the end of the godless world system is rapidly approaching. Step up, if you would, and look at verse 14. It says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that, was, uh, that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is, uh, is come for for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. The, endless of the, uh, end, the end of the godless world system. Now, who is this person sitting on the cloud? What do you think? Called the Son of Man. Yeah, what do you think, Joe? You think it's Christ. I do too. It's the term that Jesus used of himself more than any other term, son of man. Now, some of you may have like a son of man, and, um, but let me explain to you why I think that that is, is correct. Um, first of all, uh, this uh, is a person who at least appears to be human. All right? And the, the title does fit the Lord. And the actions of what he does fit the Lord. Because uh, there are, by the way, many references to this. The crown that he's got on, by the way, is the Stephanos, which is typically a crown of victory. Okay? So it's like a victor's crown. And let me just show you one reference. Go back with me to Daniel chapter 7, if, you could, if you're fast. If you're not, just, just hang where you're at. Daniel chapter 7. And I'm going to read at the end of a vision that Daniel had, which also pertains to, we're getting toward this time period when Christ is going to establish his kingdom. Daniel chapter 7, I'm looking at verse 13 and 14. 
It says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. <coughs> and if you recall, this, this being, whoever it is, is sitting on a cloud. And came to the Ancient of Days, that's obviously God, God the Father, and they brought near, uh, him near before him, and there was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. And I will tell you, there wouldn't be a Jewish scholar worth his salt that didn't connect that with the Messiah. And where this would enter in in the life of Christ, when he's standing before the Sanhedrin, and they're, they're unsuccessful at being able to pin any crime upon him for which they can condemn him. Finally, in frustration, the high priest says, I adjure thee by God. Tell us whether you're the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One. Tell us if you're really the, the Messiah. And Jesus answered with that passage in Manuel, Daniel 7. He said, I am. And then he said, hitherto you're going to see me coming in the clouds of heaven. He's referencing Daniel 7. And if you remember, at that point, they ripped, he ripped his garments, the high priest did, acting like he's in great mourning because he said that Christ had blasphemed by saying that he was the son of man, the fulfillment of that prophecy. So when I look at Daniel chapter 14, I really do think that the person on the cloud is the Christ himself. And so then what does this vision mean? When, when if, if it is Christ reaping the harvest of the earth, what would that basic meaning be? I'm sorry? Okay, Karen's thinking maybe he's bringing his people in. Certainly what the idea is this. Time on this earth to rebel against God is, 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 is almost gone. He's reaping this world. It's time for the rebellion to stop. And then the last little vision, and so here's how I put it. The earth is now ripe for God's judgment. Christ is about to bring the final judgments upon the earth to take it back under God's control. And that leads us to this final little vision, which is the consequences for this rebellion, the horrific consequences that they are. And it's another, verse 17, another angel. One, one commentator pointed this out, I thought it was kind of interesting. You have three angels in the first part of chapter 14. Then you seem to have Christ sitting on a cloud, and now there's actually three angels again in chapter, uh, at the end of chapter 14. Starting with verse 17. Another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that, sat upon, that, that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her gr grapes are fully ripe. And, and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city. Blood came out of the winepress even unto the, the uh, horse bridles by the space of 1,600 furlongs. That's roughly 200 miles. What does this mean? I believe we're talking about the consequences for rebellion against God and the fact that they are going to be horrific. Now, what does the, gr the blood from the grapes mean? It seems to indicate human blood. We, whether or not we know that, we're not... Certain, but it seems to indicate that. So then what is the significance of the amount of blood? What's he saying? Why is there just this horrific amount of human blood being shed? I'll take you to two passages. Um, you can leave Revelation 14 behind. The only thing is I'm going to be at chapter 19. So I'm going to go to two spots. The first one is in Zechariah chapter 14. Now that's an Old Testament. So what you want to do, you want to go back to your book of Matthew in the New Testament and go two books in front of it to the book of Zechariah. <clears throat> Zechariah 14 is the last chapter of his book. He has a number of, of visions, and in this particular one, we're just going to look at the first three verses. I just want you to see one major thing. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. Now I want you to think about that. All nations. 
against Jerusalem. And the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. Half of the city shall, be, shall go forth into captivity. The residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So what I want you to think about <clears throat> is two things. First of all, the, the, the nations of the world gathered against the nation of Israel, specifically your capital, Jerusalem, surrounding it, taking a, a large part of it, and abusing the women, uh, just, you know, just all kinds of horrific things going on. If you are sitting in a place where you can do something about it, if you're sitting where God's sitting, what would you think of that? What would you do in response to that? Well, as this time of, of, of rebellion is, is wrapping up, Christ is going to step in. I want you now to go to Revelation chapter 19, and we're going to look at what I believe is the same situation. Revelation chapter 19, just from a different angle, Verse 11. Remember that when we're in chapter 14, 13, and 12, those are parentheses. Those are not time sensitive. This is when, uh, at the end of the tribulation period, when, when God is dealing with the nations of the world. So, chapter 19 of Revelation and verse 11. And I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and, notice it, make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Three guesses as to who that is. That's Christ. Coming back to deal with the sinful world that's in rebellion against him. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. The very image that we saw in chapter 14, the winepress. He hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. I saw an angel standing in the sun and cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, the flesh of them that sit on them, the flesh of all men, both small, free and bond, small and great. Who are these people? Who's this army? I would submit to you as the same army that will be surrounding Jerusalem one day to destroy it. And I saw the beast, that's the Antichrist, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse, that's Christ and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, with them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire and brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Horrific consequences for their rebellion against God. Notice the whole world gathered against Jerusalem and the enemies literally slaughtered at the return of Christ. Now what do we conclude from all this? Whoa. We covered a lot of ground. First of all, Satan's kingdom of lies often seems powerful and unshakable, even to us, those of us who are children of God. And we can become, as Christians, we can become discouraged and we think, well, we can't resist. There's nothing we can do. How much more would the people of that day feel? There's nothing we can do. And the lost, imagine being a, a lost person. And you don't know whether you should receive Christ or not. Because it's like, if I do that, I'm completely going to be ostracized from society. I'm going to be persecuted, possibly, very probably, to my death. And what is God saying to the lost? Well, it's, um, it's, it's, you're, you're going to have to give up your life. Rather interesting, I, I told you last week, I think it was, about um, the, um, uh, the pastor whose um, his mother was Hindu. I think I told you about that and, and how God gave. I thought it just happened uh, recently. Actually, it happened a few years ago. I actually met the man. I was hoping I would. 
Um, his daughter and, and Charity are good friends, and they work together at the camp. So I wanted to get his version of that story, of the conversion of his mom. And so he's, um, uh, these are Indian from India, but they live, his, his family lives in New Zealand. His parents live in New Zealand. And so, uh, yeah, he told me how, the, uh, how his, his family, who uh, were unconverted Hindus, how they tried to keep uh, him from being able to witness to his mom as she was dying. And um, interestingly enough, uh, he said that this, the hospital staff was honoring the wishes of his mother. His mother wanted to see her son. And so when she would go to a certain room for treatment, then he would be allowed to call her, and that's how he witnessed to her over the last few days when she would be alive. And at the end, as I told you, his father um, had, had it out with, his, with, with, with the Christian son and said, listen, we're going to go into the hospital, and we're going, to, we're going to put the question to your mother, and she's going to say once and for all uh, how she's going to die. Hindu or Christian. Of course, he was, the dad was absolutely convinced that his wife would, would say that she would die a Hindu. And when she said that she would die a Christian, I asked Ashish, that's his name, I said, what did your dad think of that? And he said, my dad was furious that she would die a Christian. Folks, we worry about the rejection of other people at many times that keeps us from following Christ, from even accepting Christ. We have no idea what it will cost people in this day. That's why you need to know Christ now. But we'll see that, that people are, are literally faced with a life and death decision of if, if whether they not want to receive Christ. And God also reminds us, and he's given us these truths to remember that he will protect his own according to his will. Some, like the 144,000, will be protected till the end. There are many others who will die for their faith. But they will go on and obviously meet their reward in heaven. And yet God is still reaching across the world, is he not? To, to, uh, to, to give the gospel to people. And he's doing that very same thing today. A lot of times we feel like, well, well uh, what about those people that have never heard? Um, can I just take you to one spot? I think we have to, because that's a question that is common in our society today. Go with me to Romans chapter 1, just quick, quickly. You can leave Revelation behind. What about those people that have never heard? Romans chapter 1. Is it a problem? And I'm, I, By the way, I'm all for missions. I'm all for, for taking the gospel to the world. We have an obligation to do that. The Lord gave us that commission. But I would submit to you that unsaved man across the world knows far more than we think he does. Romans chapter 1, look at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold, that's the way it is in the King James, the word there means suppress the truth. That's what the word literally means, or hold down the truth in unrighteousness. So the first thing that the Apostle Paul is telling us why God is angry with mankind is not that he hasn't got enough information, it's because he's rejected the information that God has already given him. You say, are you certain on that? Well, look at verse 19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Now, what does that word manifest mean? Revealed openly. For God hath showed it unto them. God says, I know what you know. I know you know I exist. I know that because I gave that knowledge to you. As a child begins to uh, have his own thoughts and begins to reason and think, God is there. He knows he's there. Where do we get that knowledge from? God says, I gave it to you. But he says, you know what else? I gave you something else. Look at verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. The idea is this. God, through his creation, shows us that he is there. We know that. We know that. Even his eternal power and Godhead, <clears throat> excuse me, so they are without excuse. 
No man is going to stand before God and say, I would have accepted you. You wouldn't reach out to me. Not so. Not so. God says, I've shown you that I'm there. I put that knowledge in your heart. What's he saying? God will protect his own. According to his will, God reaches out to the lost of this world. And thirdly, Satan and his kingdom and his followers are doomed. Say, why would God throw people into hell? Here's why. Because you chose your sin and the devil over him. And that was your choice. Not his. 2 Peter 3.9 says that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men call it slackness. He's long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish. And that word any, I believe, means any. God's not rejoicing... That people go to hell. Matter of fact, he says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Ezekiel 18, verse 4. No pleasure. The reality is, God has given you a sacred choice. And you can choose your sin and the devil, or you can choose him. But loyalty to Christ is worth the cost. That's the truth. So if you're lost, you should fear the consequences of living under the domain and the lies of Satan. And yes, it may seem easier now, and it may seem like everybody's on your side. And I will tell you, it'll be all the more during the period we're looking at. But the reality is you're living for a house of cards. It's all coming down. And if you're saved, you should have joy and confidence and love raging in your heart. You say, joy? Absolutely, because your past is forgiven. Your present has God-given purpose. And your future is to live eternally in God's presence. You should have joy. You should have confidence. Why? Because as a child of God, you are more than conquerors in Christ. That's who you are. That's who God made you to be. You say, I don't feel like that. Well, I get that. I don't always uh, win the victories in my own heart and life either. But I will tell you this. The reality is, is that we're not what we were. We're different. God changed us. And the new spirit that he's put within us is perfect. The Holy Spirit. And he is making us into the image of Christ. It is a wonderful transformation. And we ought to have love. You know why? We ought to have love for God because what he's done for us as Christians. We ought to have love for our fellow Christian brothers and sisters because they're part of our family. And we ought to have love for the lost around us because God loved us enough and desires to save them and he loves them too, so we ought to love them in his name. As Christians of all people, we ought to have joy and confidence and love because we stand before and we live for a loving and eternal God. Do you know know him? I pray that you do. And if not, I pray that you will give your heart to Christ and serve him uh, your, your entire life, all your days. It was interesting uh, how God orchestrated, as I was telling you, this guy that I, I talked to and, and just kind of came up. He saw that I was studying out a Bible out. And so he just said, well, so what are, you, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm a pastor. I'm, I'm studying for my message for Sunday. And that kind of began a, a conversation that um, took place over... The next, uh, oh, I don't know, hour, hour and a half off and on. And it was just interesting to, that, that God opened that door of opportunity. And just able to share with him um, some things that he was wondering about and, and uh, different, um, just, just, it was a very interesting and very good conversation. But you know what? I'm convinced of this. I'm convinced that that was a God-ordained meeting. That it wasn't an accident that he lost his flight the day before. And it wasn't an accident that he decided to fly out midday. I mean, mid-evening the next day. Could have gone out possibly earlier in the morning. I don't know why he waited that long. It wasn't an accident that he saw me studying with my Bible. It wasn't an accident that we got this conversation. You know why? Because it's not because of me. It's because God loves him. God's reaching out to people all across this world. May we be part of that. May we be willing messengers for him because he really does want to save people today. 
He does. He wants to save you too if you're not saved. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we can see your hand imperfectly, very imperfectly. There are times when we get a glimpse of what you're doing. But Lord, that's just, again, the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Lord, we are grateful that you are calling people across the world. And yes, we're seeing it maybe more blatantly um, in these, uh, at the end times that we're talking about. But Lord, the reality is you're calling people right now. And as Christians, Father, maybe we be part of your messengers. No, we're not one of the 144,000. But Lord, we are privileged, those of us who know you, we're here for a reason. And you've allowed us to be messengers in this generation. Oh Lord, open our mouths, give us opportunity, help us to take advantage of them. And we pray for the salvation of friends, yes, neighbors, yes, strangers that you bring across our paths. Oh Lord, help us. Help us to walk with you and be alert to your spirits urging in our lives and open our mouths to say what you want us to say. I also pray, Lord, for those who may be here and the reality is if Christ were to return, they're not ready. And, and they would be facing these horrific days. Oh, I pray, Lord, for your mercy upon them, that they'd understand that, that the door is open, yes, that the gospel is available. But now's the time when we understand, and, and Lord, when we can still do something for you, I pray that you'd open our hearts and minds and, and help any who do not know you to put their faith in Christ even this day. Thank you for the joy of being together in Jesus' name. Amen. With our heads bowed for just a moment. Christian, let's understand that God has us here for a reason. And, and let's, let's ask God to continue to give us opportunities to speak for him. And I pray that, that we not get distracted by the foolishness of life, honestly, that we can get involved in. And let's, let's be focused on walking with God throughout the day and then letting him give us opportunities as he would direct and even ask for them. I'd encourage you to do that. But if you're here this morning and, and, and you don't know Christ as Savior, why would you wait on that decision? What's the, what's the reason for that? If you understand, now again, if you have questions, certainly get, get those answered. We'd love to talk to you about that. But if you know that you need Christ, if you know that, why would you wait? Why would you risk your soul? I pray that if God is speaking to your heart, that you would, you would open your heart and mind to Christ even right now. Invite him into your life. Let him have your life. And let him use you to reach other people before these horrific days come. Is there anyone here and you'd say, Pastor, I, I'm not sure about my salvation. I'd like to talk to somebody about it. Anyone like that? I, I really, I, I don't want to, I, I see the foolishness of delaying this. I want to know. Now, as I'm scanning, I'm not seeing anybody, but if that's where you're at, please don't hesitate. Talk to me, okay? Or someone else you trust, get the answers that you need. Father, bless these folks, and I thank you for those that know thee, and I believe that there have been some who have been praying for opportunities. Lord, may we just walk throughout our day, whatever we're doing, in your presence, fellowshipping with you, um, trying to be a blessing in your name. And Lord, use us. Because we have a lost world that needs to hear the truth. And so Lord, open our mouths and our minds and our hearts, we pray. And I pray for those who may be here in the reality is they don't know where they're going to go. And they're maybe embarrassed to admit it. Or there's some other excuse that Satan's thrown in front of them. Lord, knock down those excuses, we pray, for their good and for your eternal glory. Pray this in Jesus' name. Thank you, you are dismissed.